So only one person, right? Okay. Right. Hi, Sophie. How are you doing? Can you hear me well? I can. I'm doing pretty well. Did you say one person? Is that me? Yeah, it's only you for now. So hopefully <laughs> more people join us today. Okay. We hopefully actually so. have 17, 17 sign up uh, for this class, but we'll see. Nice. Uh, we also have some people in person, uh, only three, right? Yes. It's like around three people that were supposed to come today in person, but we'll see. Anyway, um, my name is Andy Figueroa. I am a business outreach specialist with the Alliance Center. And, you know, this is one of the presentations that we have put together for business owners like many others. But I think this one is very important for people in the construction industry. Correct? Uh, yes. Yes, mainly. Uh, and other. And other, and and other, other industries. industries. Yeah, Sophie, uh, if you are new to the center, this is a center sponsored by the Office of Economic Development with the city of Thornton. So we provide services for small businesses, including uh, educational workshops, technical assistance, meaning that we help people navigate, uh, you know, the sometimes complex uh, bureaucratic system, right, in the government, like getting licenses, permits, and all of that. And we also uh, have this space available for any trainings, any, you know, uh, meetings with, you know, with the small companies, they can utilize it. They can connect to the internet, use the computers, and in addition to that, we also offer grants. So those grants are only for commercial businesses uh, in the city of Thornton. And they range from $10,000 up to $20,000. Uh, all the services, this is important for me to mention, all the other services, consulting sessions, uh, educational workshops, uh, you know, the co-working space, everything is free and everything is available to anyone, even if they don't live in the city of Thornton. Okay, cool. so welcome, and I'm gonna hand it over to Nancy. Hi. Nancy, thank you. Yes, um, thank you, Sophie, for being here. I really yeah. appreciate it. Um, I have a presentation that I'll go through, but first I'd like to just introduce myself a little bit. I am a retired federal employee. I worked for the United States Department of Labor in the Occupational Safety and Health Administration for 34 years. I was a compliance officer as I went out and did inspections of workplaces. I was a training instructor and I worked my way up and my last job was acting regional administrator in Denver where I was in charge of six states uh, and about a hundred employees in this sort of, you know, Colorado and the Western sort of North and South Dakota, Montana, Wyoming, Utah and, and Colorado. So I've had a wonderful career. It was uh, a great learning experience. And the thing that I loved best about it was that I got to save lives. And that's how I really felt about what I did. So um, after I retired a year ago, I decided to um, volunteer for an organization called SCORE. And they are the retired uh, executives, um, a group of people that try to help small businesses. And my one thing in all of my career was, boy, if people knew, because OSHA would come in and do an inspection, they like, we never heard of you before. It's like, if people just knew, and especially the smaller employers and the smaller businesses just knew what they could have available to them or how to be safer and how to do their job safer, my job would have been easier, but it really wasn't about my job. It was really about saving lives of people. So my goal today is really just to talk about what is OSHA and what are the main responsibilities for employers regarding the OSHA Act, and then um, where you can find some help. And there's free help for uh, occupational safety and health that I'll, I'll let you know. So. Um, I have a PowerPoint, so when I put it on, Sophie, I'm not going to be able to see you, but okay. if you have any questions, just let me know. Okay, thank you. All right, so, and we're still sharing, right? Can you see the slide, Sophie? Yes, I can. The one that says classroom one? No, no it's a oh. in introduction to OSHA. No, I don't see that anymore. I did see it a little earlier. You guys were toggling through screens. So I work in um, auto repair. So that will be, this is applicable, right? Same, same world? Absolutely, absolutely. I don't think I have any pictures of auto repair with me today, but these <laughs> are 
a series of pictures that I've collected over my career that um, will talk about the hazards involved on each of these. So the, the picture with the man at the hard hat, he is actually an OSHA compliance officer checking the expiration of a fire extinguisher. <laughs> and um, the other one is a gentleman who is in water in an aluminum oh. ladder oh. with a electric power. Yeah, so you could tell this is like a bad idea because he's even wet from like the waist down. I mean, this is this really is not a good, a good situation. No. So um, I'm going to start off at the beginning, and that is OSHA's mission. So um, what OSHA set out to do is to assure, so far as possible, that every working man and woman in this nation have safe and helpful working conditions. And in 1970, the act was signed by President Richard Nixon. Um, and put into law so that before 1970, there was no OSHA, but there was a grave concern about preserving the resources of America. The, the problem was at that time, more than 14,000 workers lost their lives each year. And if you think about that in perspective, um, 14,000 people a year died just from going to work in America. And I, I equated it one time to the Iraqi war where we lost like 7,000 people in five years and people were appalled, but we lose that many. Uh, we, at that time in 1970, we were losing so many. Now today, today's numbers are around 5,000, maybe 5,200 workers still lose their lives every day going to work. So this is an actual picture of a bobbin factory where they're actually weaving materials and those are children. Um, we now have labor laws and you do have to wear shoes now when you go to work. Hi, welcome, Hi, I'm Nancy. Gloria, nice to meet you. And Sophie's on, on Zoom joining us. All right, so the OSHA Act says that each employer has to provide a workplace which is free from recognized hazards. They have to comply with OSHA standards and regulations, and they need to become familiar with the standards that are applicable in their workplace. So I know, Sophie, you said you're in automotive, and Gloria, what, what is your business? Yeah, I work with the medical business. Okay. And we want to learn a little bit of the Okay, uh, great, it's nice of you to come. So the picture in this one is something called a lockout tagout, which would apply obviously in the automotive industry, but um, I'm going to talk about what that means, but you can see there's a lock on that electrical box so nobody can get in there and turn a machine on when somebody might be working inside of it. So we'll talk more about that in, in just a minute. So those, those three things are the employer's responsibility. You need to provide a, a workplace free of hazards, comply with OSHA standards, and become aware of the standards that are applicable for your industry or your specific workplace. So what OSHA does is it uses tools that are strong, fair, and effective enforcement. And yes, they'll come into a workplace, they'll issue citations, there'll be fines attached to them, and sometimes people aren't so happy, but that's what our enforcement is about. Um, the second tool that OSHA has is outreach and education and compliance assistance. And that's kind of what I'm doing today. I'm giving assistance to folks who need help. Hi. Hi, how are you? Well, you not so properly? Uh, no, you look Hi. fine. Hi. Welcome. Hi, I'm Nancy Hodder. Nice to meet you. And so, um, so OSHA's tools are this fair, strong fair enforcement outreach, education, and compliance assistance. And then we have cooperative and other um, partnerships and programs for folks who want to do better at getting into safety and health. So I'll go through each of these um, individually, but this picture and this gentleman, this was taken in Chicago where I worked for many years. This gentleman is doing tuck pointing. So he's grinding out the mortar in between the bricks. And as a result, what's happening is he's creating a dust and in that dust is silica, more than likely, gets into your lungs. It causes a disease called silicosis. There's no cure for it. There's no remedy for it. So we want to make sure this gentleman is protected. And I don't know if you can see, he's got a respirator on. He's got a mask. He's got his hard hat. He's got his fall protection here. And uh, he's probably doing very well. Um, 
better than most, I would say, that I've seen in my career. <laughs> so, and we'll talk more about these things as we go on. So within the OSHA Act, there's a section 5A1, and sometimes OSHA people talk in numbers and terms and people don't understand. So if you don't understand what I say, just ask the question. But the uh, general duty clause or section 5A1 of the Act says that employers must furnish a place of employment free of recognized hazards. So OSHA will issue citations under section 5A1, the general duty clause, when there are no other specific standards. Now I talked about lockout tagout, and that would be a standard that we would cite. I'm gonna talk about those numbers in just a second, but you know, what, what OSHA, you would use the general duty clause and had used the general duty clause for COVID. So when workplaces were having people work when they knew they were sick with COVID and didn't give them protections to protect themselves, OSHA would come in and they could cite something so new like COVID under the general duty clause. So how will you protect Right. It would be mostly for places like hospitals and healthcare facilities, nursing homes, places where you would expect people to have. Uh, okay. 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 Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it gets a little tricky, and then the lawyers get involved in some of it to make sure that OSHA issues the citation properly. So I don't know if you can see this picture, but this gentleman here, he's got his hand inside a machine. No, this, that's a bakery. This is a commercial bakery. You can see the dough. I don't know if you can see the dough here on the side. And then, um, so hopefully if someone has to go inside of a machine to clear a jam, to retrieve a part, to fix something, what they need to do is that lockout tag out that I showed you, lock out the energy that's powering the machine so when they go inside, it doesn't start up on them. So many workers have lost their limbs because they didn't lock out and they didn't maybe lock out all the sources of energy. The other thing in this picture I wanna show you is you see this little black dot on this gentleman's shoulder and then this little black wire going down to his waist. Yep. He's being monitored by OSHA for noise. So there's a, a, a level of noise that a person could be exposed to at work considered safe is 90 decibels over eight hours. So at this particular inspection, the OSHA investigator wanted to measure this gentleman for noise. All right. So other OSHA standards, um, an overview. So what OSHA, all the standards codified under OSHA are under Title 29 of the Code of Federal Regulations. 1910 is for the general industry. So Sophie, your automotive stuff would be covered in there. 1926 is for the construction industry. And 1915, 1917, and 1918 are under the maritime standards um, for shipping. I don't think we have much of that in Colorado. Um, construction is um, in OSHA's eyes, one of, it's one of the most hazardous industries out there. Logging actually is the hazardous and construction is like number two. So, um, but if you look at this picture, this was also taken in Chicago. There is a van with a trailer on wheels with a scissor lift on top of the flatbed, raised up to the height of the roof with a ladder unsecured um, and this gentleman did get a citation for this. There's numerous hazards on here because the number one killer of workers in America, the number one thing that kills workers is falls. And the number one thing that they fall off of is ladders. They also fall off of construction. Um, oh, Diane Sanchez wants in. Okay, all right. So those are the standards that OSHA has to comply with or that are available for you to comply with. I would say, don't go and read the whole book. We'll, we can get you the specific ones you need, but just to make it easy for today, I made a list of the top 10 standards. Let me see if they'll come up. Here they are. 
So the top 10 most frequently cited OSHA standards are on the list. I pulled this off of the OSHA website today. This list comes out every April. And in my experience, the top 10 are pretty much the same. They just might change their order a little bit. So I know for those of you in the room, it's a little bit hard to see, um, but this is all available online at OSHA.gov. So the number one most frequently cited OSHA standard in the nation is fall protection and construction. What I say, the number one killer of workers is falls. The number one industry that's hazardous is construction. So, um, and these little pictures kind of show you that so we want people to be protected from falls. And I don't know if you remember the gentleman that was on, uh, that was doing the, uh, 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 the scraping out the brick mortar. He had actually the fall harness on and a lanyard. It's not gonna stop you from falling, but it's stop you from hitting the ground. Basically. <laughs> so, so that's why they wear those, those devices. The number two most frequently cited OSHA standard is, and this was in 2021, is respiratory protection. And normally this one is in the top 10, but it's usually not number two. Mm -hmm. And I believe it's number two because of the COVID yeah. requirement to wear COVID masks and have that protection available. So the, the mask um, was regulated, the mask that we have to use in COVID was regulated by OSHA? It was in the workplace, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, with the respiratory protection standard, the, the piece of it requires to have a written respirator program. So an employer has to write their program. The, what has to be in that program is spelled out in that standard. And, 19, and this little number right next to it, 1910-134, that that'll take you to the standard where you can get the information about what is required in a respiratory protection program. Number three, most frequently cited standard is ladders and ladders in construction. If you recall, I said one of the one thing uh, workers fall off of is ladders in construction. So we cite that number, the third most frequently cited standard in the country. Um, this particular standard in 1926-1053, that will um, tell you how to construct a ladder, how far the rungs have to be apart, what what it should be made of, how you know how to treat different ladders, extension ladders, step ladders, and all the different kinds to be in there. The number four most frequently cited standard in OSHA is hazard communication. And I don't know of an industry where this standard does not apply. So this requires, the, the hazard communication standard was um, promulgated in 1983. And the whole purpose around it was that any chemical that's used in the workplace, you communicate the hazards to the user. So the manufacturer of the chemical has to supply the information or communicate those hazards to the person who buys it. And then the boss of the place has to communicate it to the employees that are actually using it. So this is a requirement for safety data sheets. I don't know if you're aware of these, so every chemical produced in the world has these safety data sheets. The, um, so if, they, if you have a chemical or a paint or a, a cleaner of some sort and you want to get the material safety data sheet because you don't have it, you call the manufacturer and you say, I need this. And they say, well, I don't have one. Then they are in violation of the law. So um, throughout the world, it's called global harmonization of hazard communication. So like China and the EU and the United States and Canada and Mexico have all come together and said, what should be on these sheets? Mm -hmm. All the elements that should be there and the training that goes with it. Also in the hazard communication standard requires that you have a written program that spells it out. So um, it's all in that standard if you wanna look it up. And if you have any questions later, I'd be happy to answer them. Number five, most frequently cited standard is scaffolding and construction. Uh, here's a picture of a scaffold, this little mock-up. But usually what we see on scaffolds is they're not on level ground sometimes. Mm -hmm. They don't have the guardrails. They're missing the fall protection. Um, they're not assembled properly. They're bent, they're damaged, and they can fall apart. So um, 
real easy for a compliance officer to drive by a scaffold and look at it. And if they see it doesn't look right, they'll stop and do an inspection right away. Number six uh, is the fall protection training and construction. So we had fall protection was number one, but the training of that fall protection is number six. So maybe they give them a lanyard, but they don't tell them how to use it. Or there's sometimes they'll be sneaky and they'll wear their harness, but they don't they attach it. Okay. Yeah, so they, there are things that, um, you know, maybe look nice, but aren't actually in compliance. Number seven most frequently cited is the um, control of hazardous energy or this lockout tagout. It's a very serious um, uh, standard. As I said, numerous people get caught up in machines. They lose legs, they lose arms and other body parts because they don't deactivate every piece of energy. So some might have electrical energy, they might be powered by gas or propane, or they might have a secondary source, a pneumatic source, you have to lock out each one of those and make sure nobody goes in there and turns it on while they're inside of it. Uh, number eight is eye and face protection and construction. So if someone's going to protect their eyes from flying sparks or um, bits of pieces, they need to protect their face as well. So a face shield and eyeglasses or goggles, depending on what the hazard. Goggles typically for liquids. If you're dealing with liquid chemicals, you would put goggles on. But if it's flying uh, like dusts or metal pieces, um, use the glasses with the side shields. Should work. Uh, number nine is powered industrial trucks. And this is in general industry. So it's under 1910.178. But these are not buffer cars, I tell people. These, you have to have proper training. There are certain things that you have to know about the load that you pick up. You can't lift it too high. There was one training program where they actually told the person to stick their head out and look behind them before they backed up and the guy hit his head on the, on the side of a beam because he wasn't watching where he was going and he was outside of the cage. They have to have seat belts. Some of these are gas powered, some of them are electrical. So it just depends on the type of powered industrial vehicle that might be in the workplace. But I don't know, you might see these at Costco or you know, Sam's Club and they always like block off the aisle so nobody can come around. Um, there's also load limits. You can't lift too much because they'll tip over. Mm -hmm. Or if you're on a slant, you have to be very careful on how you use these things. And it is the number nine most frequently cited standard within OSHA. And the last one seems very simple, but it's up here every year. Number 10 is machinery and machine guarding. So this picture's got two like uh, nip points, we call them. They're ingoing gears where somebody could get their hand stuck if there isn't the guard over it. Saws, any radial arm saws, band saws, any grinders, uh, uh, bench grinders, wheel grinders, all need to have that moving part protected. And um, unfortunately, they're not sometimes. So that's under 1910.212. So um, OSHA.gov right here is a website. And I'll show you their homepage in just a minute, but that's where I pulled this information from. To the next slide. All right. So if OSHA does come out and they do an inspection, they will um, maybe they'll look for the hazards and they'll find any violations like machine guarding or for protection. And then they will issue citations and penalties. So there are different variety of violations. And the first kind that we have is called other than serious, it means that it's not a serious hazard, it's other than serious. So let's say for example, um, you're supposed to sign your log of injuries and the CEO didn't sign it. Now it's not gonna kill anybody because he or she forgot to sign it, but it is technically a violation. So it would be considered another than serious. Serious violations are those that cause death or serious physical harm. 
So, and the penalty is up to $14,502. Uh, $14, maximum for a serious violation. So here's a lovely picture of a fall protection hazard. Uh, here's a gentleman on top of a pile of unstable blocks on top of a scaffold that doesn't have fall protection, lifting heavy things in awkward postures. I'm not sure how high up he is, but it looks like this might be a roof line mm -hmm. along here, this one. So he could be well, one story, two stories up, maybe 20 feet. I mean, I don't know if you fall four feet or you fall 24 feet is probably going to be a serious physical harm. Yeah. So, so um, this guy got a citation. And um, as I said, serious violations can go up to $14,502. The next type of violation is called a willful. And a willful violation means that the employer knew that it was a hazard and did it anyway. Kind of like a, like a moral sin, right? <laughs> you knew it was wrong and you still did it, right? <laughs> so um, let's just say the boss of this gentleman here doing this job said, ah, and this guy says, I don't want to go up there, I'm afraid. And the, and the boss says, no, it's fine. I checked it myself, go up there and do the job. That's mm -hmm. willful. He is willfully violating the law. And if it is found to be so, the intent is willful, the fine can be up to $145,027. It's fine to go to the company. The, fine, the company is fined, the money goes into the general treasury for the United States government. So it doesn't go to OSHA, it goes to the, the greater good, as I used to like to say. And then the, G, uh, the company can uh, imply the, the worker in some way money or not? Like a, the salary can be affected? No, no, the employee cannot be held responsible. Okay. And we'll talk about that in, in just a minute. Yeah. So the next type of violation is called a repeated violation mm -hmm. and the fines can be up to $145,027. <laughs> um, and that is, let's just say you had a, a machine that needed a guard and the guard wasn't on there. So they got a citation, you paid the citation, you fixed it, you put the guard back on and then OSHA comes back, I don't know, six months later, happens to be there and they go to the same machine and the guard is not there. So it was fixed and now it's not, it was repeated and OSHA can issue a citation for repeat. We call it repeat. The failure to abate or the last one that's listed there is, is kind of like a repeat, but it was never corrected. So OSHA can find, if we issued the citation for that machine guard and you never fixed it and they came back six weeks later, they can cite the company $14,502 for every day that that machine was not guarded up to 30 days. We wouldn't go over 30 days, but they would go up to 30 days. So that's what the difference is between uh, all the different types of violations and the penalties amount. Now you might ask me, why is it 14,502? <laughs> why is it 27? Why isn't it just a nice round number? That's because under the law, OSHA has to change its penalties every year in January based on the consumer price index. So that might be, I think last year it was like 1.1 or something like that. So it goes up whatever hundred dollars and it might look goofy like that. Which, yeah. When I started working for OSHA in 1987, um, the serious violation was $1,000. And the willful was 10,000. Yeah. Things have changed. Things have changed. So OSHA has a hotline. It's 1-800-321-OSHA. And that is the O on the telephone is a six, not the operator zero, it's the six. Um, but um, so anytime a facility or a workplace has a fatality or a severe injury, they have to call OSHA in this number and report it. 
Now, all employers are required to notify OSHA when an employee is killed or suffers a work-related hospitalization. That means they're admitted into the hospital, um, not just sent and released, they have to be admitted. Um, and amputation or a loss of an eye. That's when you have to call. Fatalities have to be reported within eight hours. And the other, the inpatient hospitalization, the amputation, the loss of the eye, you have 24 hours to call. This is the number, 1-800-321-OSHA. Who calls at a company? The company is responsible to call. Okay, how about if they don't call? Oh. If they don't call, they get a violation. That's a violation. violation. Yeah, they get a fine. They get a fine. So um, most people call. Yeah, they have they have to. Right. And sometimes, you know, like you're watching the five o'clock news or, or, you know, OSHA will see it. Oh, an explosion at. Yeah, they can, they can hide. Right. They will. Right. And then we'll get the call later. Even if it's sometimes we get the call at two in the morning, we have a call center and they'll direct it. So the, when you call this number, the call is going to Washington, D.C. And then they figure out what area, what we call area office, OSHA jurisdiction, and they'll send the information there. Is it possible breakers so that they can go and check to see if a person was hurt or that company had an accident? Yes. It is public record. It is public record. Yeah. So OSHA has to send that to where we can go to protect? Yes. Where we, a yes. person or something? Uh, company. company, not person, not person, company. Okay. So, um, question was asked earlier about when the company gets the fine, does the employee get, you know, does it come out of their pay? So, um, back in 1970, when the law was enacted, Congress was very smart and they put in section 11 C of the act, which is the whistleblower section. We call it whistleblower, uh, section. And under OSHA, you cannot discriminate from an employee, fire them, lay them off, blacklist them, demote them, deny them overtime pay, discipline, deny their benefits, failure to hire or rehire, intimidate, reassign them to other places or reduce their pay or hours because they have safety and health concerns. So OSHA has a separate section of whistleblower investigators that if that happens and that employee says, hey, I was standing on these pile and I got you know, uh, demoted or I was told not to come back, they call the whistleblower investigator and they will do an investigation. And the goal is to try to get their job back. For them. Sometimes back pay, sometimes other things, it just depends. So when OSHA started, we only did what we called 11C or whistleblower investigation. Now, Congress, every time it seems to us that um, there's a law passed that has a whistleblower element in it, the enforcement of that law goes to OSHA. So that's what I mean by tw over 20 different statutes now that they are required to investigate, like the consumer safety, uh, consumer product safety, you know, for toys, you know, like, you know, lead in your Crayola crayons for your kids that went to OSHA. Enron, uh, I don't know if you know that name, but that was like 20 years ago. That's the financial, um, the whistleblower who, who turned them in, got coverage under OSHA, did the investigation. So Sarbanes-Oxley is the law. So anytime there's a new law like that, for some reason, they give it to OSHA to investigate. But this is the main one that we do, is if they have safety and health concerns, some, an employee can call OSHA and say, I wanna make a complaint against my boss, my workplace. And they could say, well, he's making me stand on all these bricks on top of the scaffold and, you know, you know, and we'll send an investigator out to take a look. So um, they have a right to do that. They have a right to do that. And they can't be fired or blacklisted for doing that. I mean, they're talking about people's lives. I mean, you talk about their livelihood as well, but it's their lives. It's their lives that we're really trying to protect. 
Um, the other thing OSHA has are cooperative programs. I mentioned earlier, there are things called alliances, and this is where OSHA partners with usually organizations of the industry, like the, um, when I was in Chicago, they were called the Lake County Contractors Association. Sometimes, um, you know, any other uh, group of people that want to come to OSHA, like the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, uh, we have alliances with them where we work together. Um, in Chicago, I went to those meetings. I gave them information about OSHA and how to be better protected in their jobs. Um, we have partnerships that are usually for a specific job in construction. And for example, in Atlanta, Georgia, they built a new airport, um, Hartsfield. They did a huge expansion, changed it up. It was like a multi-year project. And the general contractor wanted to partner with OSHA and they had regular meetings and all the subs and they had to do all these different requirements and police themselves essentially to have a safer workplace. So once that job is finished, that contract is finished, then the partnership goes away. But is it in the protocol when our big projects like the airport and big development in cities? Is it if they want to, it's voluntary. it's voluntary, it's completely voluntary. And then the last one is called a VPP program. And these are for companies that are really super safe and really have excellent safety and health programs. So they have to apply to OSHA. They have to share their program. They have to go above and beyond what these laws are. They have to do better than that. And then once they get approved, they get this flag, the flag looks like that, with the VPP on it and the star and the red, white, and blue. They get a flag that they can fly out in their workplace. Um, in Colorado, there are over 30 such companies in the VPP program. I just wrote down a few, I looked them up this morning, the Rocky Mountain Arsenal the uh, Ball Metal Beverage Container Company in Golden, Bechtel National in Pueblo, Black Hills Energy in Pueblo, Delta Airlines in Colorado Springs, Hunter Douglas Window Fashions in Bloomfield, uh, LPR Construction in Loveland, Molson uh, Coors has several. I mean, from Monte Vista and the Golden and a couple other places, they have like four or five different sites. And then owns Corning in, uh, in Denver. These are all companies that have excellent safety and health programs. And they are to be mentors for other companies that want to be safer. So those services are available to folks as well. I think I just have a couple more slides to talk about. Uh, this is what OSHA's website looks like. So it's OSHA.gov, G-O-V. And um, let me go back. So this is what their homepage looked like. So um, it's not live, this is a picture. So like you would just click on anything you wanna. So if you wanted to know who, you got a company, your son works for ABC contractor, you could go into the enforcement section you can go to look at their record. Yeah, and search and find out if they. For example, some people complain about the safety of Amazon. I don't have any against them, but yeah. It, it we said that they don't have all the time for rest or the conditions of the product, they yeah. can be fined. Yes, and they have. One worker per post. Yes. Uh, I guarantee you, if you looked up Amazon in the enforcement, it would be numerous mm -hmm. sites mm -hmm. across the nation. Unfortunately. Numerous sites, yes. So, um, but anyway, here's, here's just a couple of things, what it looks like. One of my favorite things I want to share with you is this little piece here where it says, remembering lost workers. Mm -hmm. So when there's a fatality, they all get reported to OSHA, they get reported to the head of OSHA who writes a condolence letter to the family. And one of my jobs in past history was to make sure those letters were 
appropriate, correct, um, before the signature went on them. And then from that information, we would propagate this, this line here. And these are this year's fatalities. And you can see this person was struck by a tailgate when he died. This person was shot by a customer at 45 years old. Um, this person, um, I did look at, he fell from a tree. He was an arborist, he was tree trimming and he fell out of the tree and died. So it breaks my heart to this day um, that there are still workers who go to work and don't come home. So um, anyway, this is OSHA's website. Feel free to use it. They also have a, um, if you log in from your own computer, it'll ask you the, the whole screen will go dark and then it'll be, do you want to sign up for the newsletter? Mm -hmm. it's, it's free. They send it, I think every month and you'll just get like what's hot, what's going on and, and things that are happening in the agency. So it might be useful to you. So in Colorado, there are, I have put only two offices up here. There are really three because the regional office is located in Denver on Spear Street across from the Denver area office. So the Denver area office is the one in yellow. They cover all this territory. There are about maybe 20 compliance officers to cover that. And then on the south is the Inglewood area office. Um, and Chad Vivian is the boss there and he covers basically this, all this blue section. And he has about the same amount of about 20 inspectors. So maybe there's 40 inspectors for the entire state of Colorado. They also have something there called a compliance assistant specialist. So if you need help or if you have questions or if you want somebody to come and do a speech, these compliance assistant specialist people, they're not inspectors, but they'll come out and they'll help people. They run those alliances, those partnerships, all the cooperative programs, that's what the compliance assistance people do. So you have that help from the federal government. And these folks, if you call their offices and you just say, look, I, I have a question, I you know, wanna know about this, they're not gonna think anything of it. You don't have to be like, oh, they got my number now. No, they, they don't do that. They, they would rather talk to you and have you do it right than have to come out and do an inspection, to be honest with you. So, so um, but please feel free to call either one of these offices. Um, and this again, this came from the website, the OSHA website, you can find it on there. Now, one other thing that's very important is that through grants from the federal government, each state has what's called a consultation program, on-site consultation program, this thing right here. The federal government funds it 90%, the state funds it 10%. And these folks are at your disposal to come out and help you get your program together. So in Colorado, this program is run by the Colorado State University up in Fort Collins. And here's the address and the contact information right here. They, um, what they'll do is you call them up and you say, hey, I've got an automotive business. I'm not really sure what I need. I've got to write this hazard communication program. Could you come out and help me? And they will. They'll come to your facility. They'll do a walk around. They'll look for hazards. They'll tell you what you need to fix. They only ask that you fix it. There's no charge to you. And then hopefully your employers, your employees are safe. But it's absolutely free to qualifying small businesses. And basically that's any business with less than 250 employees. So they're not going to Amazon, you know, they're not going to UPS, they're not going to go to Coors, but they're going to go to places that actually need it, small businesses. Yeah, and it's free. It's absolutely free. And they do wonderful work. If you think your place is too loud, they'll come out and do a noise survey and they'll measure everybody and they'll tell you how to fix the noise and how to control it, make it quieter. They're just, they're really good folks up there too. So please take advantage of them. This is where you can get help and it's absolutely 100%. You just gotta fix it. You just gotta fix your stuff. All right. So I think we have time for a quiz. All right. See that guy didn't watch his hand. <laughs> All right. First question, does OSHA 
cover wages, overtime, or vacation pay? Yes or no? No, that's the wage in hour, folks. That's the wage in hour. Diana. Diana says no. She's right. Okay. Compensation if you're injured. If you're injured, compensation? No. No. That's workers' compensation does that, not OSHA. Safety rules and regulations. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Got it right, Diana. Um, disposal of those hazardous chemicals. Yes. No. no exposure? Basically. Exposure to the chemicals, yes, but disposal, throwing them away. Uh, yeah, no. no. That's the EPA. Mm -hmm. EPA does that. So action. tell you what is the risk. Yes. Actions against you if you are retaliated against for making safety and health concerns. Yes. You guys getting 100%. <laughs> Can an employer and an employee agree to ignore or violate OSHA regulations in exchange for extra pay? No. no. Hazardous pay? No. No. Exchange. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You get extra vacation? No. no. You cannot. No, all know. All know. Right on, Diana. Right on. So um, that's really the end of my presentation. Um, but I wanted just to share this picture came from Chicago. I don't know if you can see this, but this is a gentleman doing work on this plant. Yeah, where's the fall protection at? Well, is there somebody holding him with a string or a rope? Inside. Yeah, everyone blew out there. That's impossible. And he was four stories up. And that was across the street from the OSHA office. Oh, right. so, so they took the picture and they sent it to me and they said, look at this. Can you believe this? And that was about 10 years. That's about 10 <laughs> that years. That's a violation. Call. Totally. Totally. You get a lot of uh, people Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I think that's one of the most number one, right? Yeah. So yeah. Good. And they tend to be, you know, the roofers tend to be sometimes smaller, I would say mom and pop, like, you know, family businesses. Um, and it, it, the problem is, like, if they're doing a home, a house, you know, maybe one story, maybe two, but to put the fall protection on, they kept complaining to OSHA, it cost too much money. It cost me too much money to get all the gear and do all, to do it right. And then yeah, we would just say. This is all attached to with the regulations that you have, uh, the permits. Like you have started with the construction. Right. You have to have all the rules of the standards. But sometimes they have extra employees that are not in the rules. Right. The official list. And these are to get that. Yeah. No, there's uh, there's so many sad stories, and I don't want to give you all sad stories, but in Ohio, there was a roofer that actually um, three employees fell off the roof. Three different jobs. They were cited three different times before they finally just went out of business because, you know, and, and you know, the employee, you know, the, the, the gentleman is 35 years old. He had five children and a wife and it breaks your heart they're never going to see their father again they're never going to have that in their lives so yeah i mean i show you the picture like that and we kind of make fun and joke but it's crazy you're absolutely right it's crazy so um my goal today one of my goals was if you're a small business owner and you're worried about financing and your business plan and getting your stuff together and making it, you know, getting your gear and hiring up people. The, one of the last things on your mind is safety and health, right? You know, it, it's not something, you know, totally um, that you think about in the front of it. And maybe it shouldn't be at first until you get it together, but if you can start your program this way, because what is it gonna cost if you lose an employee? How many thousands of dollars will it cost your business in a workers' compensation claim if somebody lost their leg or their eye or their, their fingers? Um, 
So that's really my goal. My goal is to my goal today was to at least let you know that there is such a thing called OSHA. It's the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. It's part of the Department of Labor in the federal government. The employer has responsibilities, not the, the employees have to comply. So if you're the employer, you need to say you have to follow safety rules. And if they don't follow the safety rules, then you can make discipline based on that. But if you don't have the rules in place and the program in place, you can't, you can't discriminate against the employees. So my goal was just to make you aware that this is out there that there are certain laws that you're required and obligated to um, comply with. And then knowing that you, you're like the one person because you're a CEO, you're the hiring manager, the human resource person and the safety person, that there's help. There's that free consultation program. There are other consul con consultants that will come out and help. Many times your insurance company will do that for you, come and help you. Um, yeah, help you get into compliance with the law. So um, that's all I had for today. Are, uh, are there any other questions? And all of that has a particular role. So do you put it up in one center of Tell somebody else. It, it will have to tell me and rules and standards. Absolutely. We are. We have advice to recommend. Okay, you have this. They comply. So, but now we have a different solution for colleagues. Yeah. Okay, to learn more about them. Yeah, and if you know, depending on your business, like if you're a nursing home, there's nursing home associations that will come and help you. Yeah. You know, construction has. Um, contractors associations that they talk about these things, you know, they get together and they review what the different hazards are. One thing that didn't show up on the top 10 that I was very surprised about construction was trenching. So, you know, they dig a hole and they you know, to put sewer pipes in or electric, you know, yep. and then cave in yep. and bury, um, bury the people alive. So um, I'm surprised it's no longer on the top 10. Yeah, it, it used to be every year and we really went out and told them and now they have to put what's called trench box. Uh -huh. You know, they put this box inside the hole to keep it from falling in on the workers. Yeah, so they're gonna have to send you Yeah, or whatever you're doing that. Yeah, it's the 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 earth yeah. basically. Mm -hmm. All right, so the, does anyone have any questions, Sophie or Diana? Did I scare you all? <laughs> no, no questions. Everything, everything is really good to know, actually. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate the on-site consultation uh, program. That, that looks like it's gonna be handy. Yeah, and the guy who runs it up there for Greg Gress is his name. He's a really good guy, really good guy. They have really qualified people that come out and help. For Colorado, we have some part of your unit, like some small businesses. Like, for example, we want help. Basically, we go to Fort Collins. Yeah, Fort Collins is. Well, they have compliance assistance people that will answer questions and do some stuff, but they won't. Um, that they won't come out and do it. They won't come out to your site and take care of stuff. They they. They only will answer phone calls. Thank you for your Thank you. You're welcome. Have a great day. Be safe. Stay healthy. Oh, yeah, definitely. Thank you very much. Have a great night. Thanks.